All of our files are free and will remain free. If you like the show, you can show support by donating $1 to help with expenses. Just use the PayPal link on our website, YouTube channel, or Facebook page. Thanks. And welcome back. We're discussing today with Daniel List, the dark journalist. And uh, let's just get right to the thread um, we were on. Uh, yes. Do you remember? <laughs> I already forgot to do you remember where we were. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no doubt we were talking about the manipulation of these narratives like the secret space program and uh, UFOs. And that the kind of manipulation that we're seeing uh, around them is that basically it's being engineered from two different sides of the spectrum, the intelligence side and the marketing side, because on the marketing side, they can squeeze the dollars out of it. And on the intelligence side, they can keep their secrets, which is really their goal, let's face it. Mm. Um, so this is about where we find ourselves. And it's not a very good position to be in. We're really squeezed in the middle. You know, and uh, I find that it's a very good place for disinformation to thrive. We're seeing this cult activity being pushed in kind of the new age side of it, which is why we call the series New Age Deep State. Yeah. It's when you get into UFOs and when you get into secret space program, you know, for me, when I look at the research around secret space program, I can't imagine for a moment that it's religious in any way, shape or form. It's just information about a program that we've put together out there. So the fact that these forces with shows like Cosmic Disclosure and with characters like Corey Good, they're making blue avians and the centerpiece of the secret space program, which is a religious idea. And they have all this religious iconography, the blue avians holding up their hand. And we've, we've had a lot of people actually point out that it's very Luciferian imagery. Yeah. Um, and so we're definitely seeing religious aspects creep in here and they're trying to make the whole thing into some kind of spiritualist revival, which is very odd uh, to do around UFOs and the secret space program. Well, I, I think um, they're onto something there already back in the day, Dr. Oh, the French guy, the ufologist, uh, Jack Jacques Vallée, yeah. Yeah, he was on to the cultish aspects of it. And if you do want to revive, if you want to make a cult for, I don't know, power, money, just mm -hmm. disinformation, uh, it's smart to, you know, put one foot into that spiritual area. Yes. Yeah, well, it's clever and clever and dangerous. <laughs> it's dangerous to us, clever for them. Yeah, uh, exactly. But if you get, you get people wrapped up in a fake religion, I mean, we, we've seen a lot of that. Yep, like most religions. <laughs> yeah, like most religions. <laughs> I mean, we've, we've already seen a lot of fallout with Scientology and what happens when you try to integrate these things and just kind of cook up your own religion out of the blue. Yeah, and not so out of the blue either, because there are some intelligence connections to the origins of uh, Scientology. But... With Hubbard, and yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's also Crowley hanging out there. And uh, on Space Program. Yes. Um, what's it called? Jack? Uh, Parson? Jack Parsons, yes. Yeah, yeah. And Parsons was a representative of Crowley's OTO there in Los Angeles and was really, we could, that would make a whole show in itself. Yeah, but you know what? I take issue with that because I agree with Hoagland that you can divide it into the Masons uh, and the, and the magicians. Nazis. No, the Masons and the Nazis, that's clear. You have hundreds of people, thousands of people who represent those factions. Right. But like I told, was it Joseph, someone I discussed this with? I regard the so-called magicians as just a sub part of the Masons because it's not that many, mm -hmm. really. It's maximum a handful and only really Jack Parsons was the most influential so I I can't I don't look at them as a third group I look at them as more fringe masons yeah yeah for many reasons well the mason part it's hard because <laughs> the masons are so magical mm, exactly. and they it is so embedded in magical rites as a matter of fact there's a great thing in Aleister Crowley's biography, where autobiography, where he's talking at a certain point about a book that he puts out, and he gets called up by this high-end 
Mason who says, look, we have to indoctrinate you into the Masons right now. You just revealed a 33 degree Mason secret. Oh, yeah, yeah. Theodore Royce. Yeah. Yes. Mm. <laughs> and so when we think about that, we can see that this magic aspect is very deeply embedded. But where did it come from? And of course, we go back to the Egyptian mystery schools when we get into that. But you could argue the same for the Nazis. Their paradigm isn't really based on scientific materialism, more <clears throat> scientific magic. So you have mm -hmm. you have both the Masons and uh, Nazis as a um, manifestation of the, the irrational. Ironically, because the ruling paradigm, the paradigm for the masses is the scientific materialism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. And and so you have that classical battle between so-called, I mean, I, I, I don't subscribe to a black and white model, but it is kind of cartoonish here. You have the quote-unquote evil forces represented in the, in the Nazi magic and the quote-unquote good forces in the Masonic magic. I'll say one thing. I think that if you were a Kurt Diebus or a Werner von Braun, you would, it would be good in your mind, to be loyal to a post-Nazi network a la Beaumont's, uh, they wouldn't feel they were betraying anything. In fact, they were really original prisoners. So in their perspective, they were doing the right thing. And the same for Masons. They would feel that they believed in America as actually a Masonic project, mm -hmm. if we go deeply into it. Uh, and uh, so they would be patriots. Of course, if you don't support... In neither Nazi Germany or post-war America, uh, mm -hmm. you wouldn't take either of those sides. But the people who were identifying belonging to one of those groups would feel themselves they were the good people, is all I'm saying. No, I, so, I, yeah, I can definitely see what you're saying. There's a, yeah. there's a core magic occult mysticism in Nazism, and there's the same core in Mason groups. Mm -hmm. And the thing is about the Masons... I don't think we understand it very well because a lot of people don't trust Masons. And then other people ascribe all these things to the Masons. And then on the ordinary front of it, it's just people and organizations and groups throughout America. Networks, basically. Yeah, yeah. right. And, and they're regular people and all the rest of it. There is a history to the Masons that gets into something totally different. There is a history and a core, kind of like a esoteric circle versus the exoteric circle. And yeah. when, you know, to try to get at the Masons from like, you know, this angle of saying, hey, the Masons are evil, we don't understand anything about the Masons from the way that it is now, but understanding its core and where it came from and how the Masons influenced American democracy and how it influenced the government is fascinating you know so i don't yeah. i don't think we're ever near to a full kind of investigation or grasp of what the masons were up to even in laying out the capital yeah yeah but our problem is that uh, if you're truth seekers we can't be simplistic right and so it's it's just uh, you know to dismiss all masons as evil conspirators are just the same as saying every german was a war criminal right i'm right. pretty sure there were even people in nazi nasa who were nazis who well at the core, they may have been more or less fascistic, but that's not a big step when you roll back into the power structure in America that was fascistic already. Right. But I'm pretty sure there's some people there who thought, OK, this is a good deal. Yeah, yeah, I can live with that. Uh, fuck the Fuhrer. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I don't think everybody was look in step, ein zwei drei, Heil Bormann, right? But... Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, some would be more nefarious than other in our views, for our values. But when it comes to the Masons, uh, there's also the fact, uh, I think it's really two things we can definitely surmise about the Masons. And that is that mm -hmm. you're more likely to have a non-materialistic view. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying no atheists are Masons, but there is a bigger chance that you're open to stuff. And the other is that um, you would be more loyal to, uh, if there's a battle in the behind the scenes in NASA, you would be more loyal to the traditional mm -hmm. U.S. power structure right. than you would be. Uh, you would be, quote, unquote, a patriot. Mm -hmm. And uh, But we can't say that you would march to some secret order because without going into the Masonic uh, mess. There's a million Masonic orders. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the theory about secret chiefs, but 
then again, nobody even within masonry are aware of them. So how would a uh, ordinary mason in Asa, <laughs> you know, take orders from someone they don't even know exists <laughs> right, right. if they if there's like a secret chief? So so that's a whole different board game. I, I think we're on to it when we're talking about networks. Either it's a Nazi network or it's the Masonic network. Mm-hmm. And then you have some weird uh, outsiders probably and, and a lot of people who are not in in these networks who are just... I guess drones. Well, there's a um, see. I think we can actually get our hands on this link between being a mason and being in political power, because there are yeah. secret societies and secret groups that interact directly with political power. But the only way we can get our hands on it is by not being one superstitious. Uh, like you were saying, all Masons are bad or secret societies are bad. It's not actually true. They they come in every stripe, as we know. Yeah, yeah. But the big question is who's in charge of who? Because uh, we know that intelligence um, agencies deliberately try to go into every private group out there. So obviously, I mean, I can become a Mason tomorrow if I want to. Mm -hmm. And you can become a Mason tomorrow if you really want to. I could facilitate that very easily. And you could probably go through other people. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not that exclusive. So then the question is, when you have a a, a structure laying there like a sitting duck, (laughs) obviously, if you're a real power player, you want some... If you don't want to control it, at least you want to know what was going on there. Yeah, that's the reason most people become masons today. It's not because they actually believe in anything ancient Egyptian or they're so against Catholicism. It's because it's a very it's good convenient it's, way if you're kind of spiritual, right? Yeah, to to bond with it's good. Ne- it's definitely good networking. Also, exactly. Yeah, and so of course CAA and those people are present. Yes, there. Uh, although the high number of masons that have assumed the presidency, I think, is fascinating. You know, and yeah, but in old days or in contemporary times, that's the question. Who would be high masons contemporary? Well, well, Ford was a high mason, and he was the, the president in seventy six. Okay. He's a corrupt, corrupt one. So. Yeah, uh, Truman was a mason. Uh, mm. So we certainly now you're right that the original masons like Washington and Ben Franklin and those people they founded the country and later they were true believers yeah, in my view yeah i just i think it's interesting that we see that link now there is a very interesting story and i want to point this out here cuz it sure. really goes along with our conversation and just sparked my recollection of this which is there's a lecture series by Rudolf Steiner about Madame Blavatsky of the Theosophical Society. Yeah, he, he wasn't so pleased with her eventually. <laughs> <laughs> he was not. But what's interesting mm. is in describing the past and how things went wrong with the Theosophical Society, he talked about how there were secret societies in America that controlled the political process. And this is a nice mm. little gem in his books back there. But uh, one of the things that he said was that Blavatsky wanted to be admitted to the order in America because of her ability as a medium and as a psychic, which was undeniable, and that they denied her uh, this privilege. And she said, I'm going to go to France and reveal the secrets of your group to another secret society in France, Mm. because they will admit me as a woman. Could would that be the co-masonry? Because they admitted women and men equally. I think it's Le Droit Humain, which is the first proper Masonic order that opened their doors to women at equal footing. Yeah, or didn't well, she name the group? No, she, well, it's very interesting. It probably is exactly that group, but she didn't say what the group was in France. Right. And I do know from a friend of mine who is a theosophist for generation of his father and his father that uh, Blavatsky did introduce some kind of Masonic kind of inner order structure Mm, in Theosophy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, she was very well versed in these secret societies, and she did eventually join the society in France. So it's probably very easy to figure out if it was them. But what's interesting is um, they decided, according to Steiner, to put her in a kind of occult imprisonment. And... um, Long story short, they basically distorted her vision-making process. Hmm. And uh, we know that later, in the last 10 years of her life, 
she did have a lot of kind of episodes that seemed erratic compared to her earlier work. Um, I mean, she yeah. was always a little bit erratic, but certainly this idea that Steiner was getting at and how he got the knowledge isn't clearly stated, but he talked about it. But he was very connected himself. Yeah. In fact, he felt the, the Theosophy wave was too Eastern oriented. Yes. And ironically, the Nazis hated Steiner. They burned down his Goethe <laughs> Annum and everything. So, so he wasn't like uh, he wasn't an ethno chauvinist or a, no uh, anything like that. But he just felt we had to connect with uh, the Western spiritual roots. And in that process, many people followed him. Yes, and uh, that was the first I think collapse. Theosophy had many collapses because it was a huge movement back in the day. Absolutely, but then it declined, and this was the first uh, I think uh, shot in the foot when he created uh, his own version. Many followed him, and yeah, so he would know what was going on at least in the European and uh, right. maybe also American. Yeah. Uh, countries. Well, you make the good point there, which is that his influence from the esoteric side, instead of this kind of Eastern school, would have been much more uh, aligned in what he definitely said publicly later was the Rosicrucian angle. Yeah. And that whole secret society of Rosicrucians, the Rosy Cross, carried down. So he's coming more from this mystical, esoteric mystery school rather than the Eastern one. And what happened was in this weird ping pong that happened with Blavatsky, according to Steiner, the Eastern initiators got their hands on Blavatsky. And he said in the, the first book, you can see Isis Unveiled is much more Western yeah. uh, oriented esotericism. But the next book, um, Secret Doctrine, Secret Doctrine, yeah. that had a whole a much more Eastern slant. So I find that interesting it's, it's, it's very true, but uh, you should add that when uh, Secret Doctrine came out, uh, that's really when beans were spelt. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Although she did Isis Unveil, like the title says, she did reveal stuff that until then had been for certain circles. Obviously, if it came out before, they would have been burned. But when uh, Secret Doctrine came out, we really got a lot of details about Atlantis and Lemuria. Yes. And most of the stuff out there is taken from yes. uh, Blavatsky. And it's interesting because an old German, uh, a mentor of sorts that I had, mm -hmm. he was born in 1919, but he died just a couple of years ago. He was very connected in, in some circles. And a colleague of him, uh, who was an... Um, What's it called? Uh, like Egyptologist, only for for Tibetan stuff. Okay. Tibetologist, maybe. Yeah. He'd found, because Blavatsky was always accused of having fabricated right. these things. Right. But she claimed herself that, no, no, it's it's kind of, not exactly channeled, but kind of clairvoyantly transferred mm -hmm. to me from the initiates, yes. whatever. But it's kind of in the middle. She didn't lie, but it wasn't <laughs> like she put it either because he found an original document, mm -hmm. where, which is a genuine ancient document that shows where Blavatsky took it from because she copied also the translation errors. Ah. That's how you could pinpoint that that's where Blavatsky took it from. Oh, yeah. So in a way, okay, the, she didn't get it handed, uh, you know, angels descending or wise masters, but mm -hmm. unless she claims she got the document from them. But then again, she didn't pull it out of her ass either. <laughs> so that makes it very interesting what we're seeing in the secret doctrine when it comes to the part that's ancient. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I, I love the part where she's battling Darwinists and oh, yeah. other scientists, uh, actually. It's, both books are amazing and crucial. <laughs> I don't think you get a real understanding of esoteric doctrine at all without reading those books. I think they're absolutely important. Um, but it's funny what you said about that because it made me think of the Mahatma letters, which were letters that appeared out of the blue to her. And it's interesting. I'd wonder if that... Yeah, but not just her. It Wasn't it a bunch of successors yes. who got those letters? Yes. Yeah. It was not only her. That's true. Um, mm. But I do find that process interesting because, of course, we get into the magical side there. I, I actually entertain a lot more um, of the magic side of things when dealing with people like Blavatsky or like Steiner because or Casey, uh, because they seem to me to have those genuine experiences and they have enough material to back up what they're saying. It's a whole life commitment and all the rest of it. Yeah, if nothing else, no matter if you agree with it or whatever, but 
if nothing else, they are obvious idealists. Yeah. They're not into it for the sex, drugs and rock and roll, right? <laughs> yeah. or, or becoming celebrities or millionaires. But they, yeah, like you said, devoted their lives to it. Now we can cherry pick, we can dismiss, so we can agree. But I recognize those kind of people for being, you know, sincere. Sure. And, and for me, that's an important thing. And, th and that's something that makes me very critical to... What's happening now. Yeah. You're right. Corey Good and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. But it's also something I want to come back to at the end when we discuss Trump. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Trump definitely is out Indeed. there. Sincerity is so... Because that's why I love politicians that's so different in their ideology, like, say, Bernie and Ron Paul. Mm -hmm. You could throw in others too, but let's take those two icons from recent time. What do they have in common? Which actually made they cooperate too, where they agreed. They're sincere. Mm -hmm. That's the point. They're not into it for obvious reasons that most American politicians <laughs> are. Absolutely. Right? So... We well, I'm going to, yeah. uh, I'll wrap up. Actually, I want to answer that. <laughs> I have a few sure. good things on there. I want to wrap up the yep. things you were just saying though. And here's how I will do it. I would say that when you look at this period of time, theosophy, so going back 1880 to the turn of the last century, 1900s, 1920, you've got movements like theosophy, you've got anthroposophy, uh, you have the movements, spiritualism, yeah, the movements that branched off of them, uh, the Edgar mm -hmm. Casey movement, and you are looking at the Gurdjieff work comes out of the same period of time. It's very different, but it also uh, is, is deep. It has to do with mystery schools, again, secret brotherhoods, the Enneagram. I mean, there's, there's so much coming out. And this is, forms the basis of an entire different wave of thinking, and it introduces things uh, to the West like reincarnation and all the rest of it that just weren't here, uh, un unless you go back to the second century. So, but in terms of modern, the modern Western civilization, reincarnation, you really get that with the Theosophical Society and with these New Age movements. So, yeah. the New Age deep state aspect. They, they did get manipulated if you go through the periods you were talking about, like the 60s and with the hippies and all the rest of it. Uh, these spiritual ideas moved in the 60s. They moved into higher consciousness. They moved into yoga. They moved into chakras. They moved into life after death. They moved into psychic experience. And those things are dangerous, I think, for controllers of society. They need to get a handle on them mm. because I do think that they tend to lose control when people start taking possession of their own consciousness. They can't have that... You know what? That's exactly what I discussed in my recent program with uh -huh. Alex Sakiris of the Skeptical Podcast. Yeah, it sounds great. I I definitely will familiarize myself with him more now that it's Skeptico. I figured out. Yeah, I have run across that before. I haven't really checked it out. If you find a time, check it out. It's called Why. Yeah, I will. Why scientism is wrong about everything. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great, great title, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That was my point. You're making it. <laughs> Continue. This is music in my ears. I would definitely say that you can see that when you look at things like the peace movement, for example, that they were manipulated, like you were saying, with intense drugs with characters, fanatics, and all the rest of it to make the rest of the movement look bad. And mm. uh, this is what we've seen with the New Age and with the UFO communities. The UFO communities were, and these are communities more of research. You know, when I say UFO community, it's, it's yeah. their community of researchers. People are interested in the topic. Hang on, don't we see this about everything? You could say Greenpeace, you could say Masons, like we talked about. Don't they want to taint and control or ridicule? Everything that can somehow be a threat to their power monopoly? I think it has to be an across-the-board pattern. Mm. There's no doubt about it. It's that thing that Fitz says, if there's one county that gets out of drug running, like, for example, there's a big movement in one of these counties to get rid of the drug running that was going on, and out of the blue, there were black helicopters were showing up, and it was real. Oh, and right. people were being harassed, and it was like, what's going on here? It's because these counties, the drug money is so important on the black budget side, that if one county gets out, right. they become the model for other counties to become liberated. So they have to be smacked down. And the same would be true in these different areas. But certainly I would I would think that, you know, ordinarily when you look at things like 
the new age or you look at things like UFO research, your first thought wouldn't be, oh, it's controlled by the government. No. Because it seems like it's some independent thing that you'll pick up and do on your own. But I think there came a point... And, and who's the government? I mean, I think these forces also control government. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. <laughs> sure. The government doesn't have that much control. <laughs> I, I think the government is the first thing they're taking over. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have, we have so many names now. We have the deep state, the breakaway civilization. Yep. Well, one of the we know one of the worst names for anything is the Illuminati. Yeah. It's it's one of the worst. Names. Let's just trash that here on the show. Yep. Um, we discussed this the last time, actually. What to call these structures? Yes, remember? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I don't but know I do if think we that... concluded anything, but we had many good candidates. <laughs> there are good, there are good candidates, and you said secret government was one of yours. I remember that. Yeah, I, no, not secret government. I think it was, um, or could it be in the cabal maybe? But you, you you stuck with Mr. Global because that's a contemporary, very valid expression. Mr. Global is something that came out of Fitz uh, and her work. And basically yeah. it, it does add up because it's this kind of phantom force. You can't get your hands on it, but you can see the work that they do. I think, I think yeah. the on the level term is the deep state. Yeah. And because that comes from the sound research of Professor Scott, and really what he did is he said, oh, there's two different things going on here. And I think that the recent wave of the media taking his term, the deep state, and applying it to everything and saying, well, there is no American deep state, don't worry about it, is fascinating. Because what happened was uh, there was a publication here in America called Breitbart, if you're familiar with them. Yeah, yeah. They do kind of alt-right uh type of material. And they started gaining uh, traction using Professor Scott's term. Now, Scott has been using that term, okay, forever, pretty much. We'll use deep politics as far back as the 70s, uh, the, deep, the deep state, at least for the last 15 years. But then suddenly, everybody started to come out of the woodwork with deep state. Well, yeah. interestingly enough, Steve Bannon was the publisher of Breitbart before he got on board with Trump. Well, uh, he wasn't the original one. That was Breitbart himself. Oh, yeah. Well, he, he passed away, as we know, which is unfortunate. But certainly Bannon took over the reins. And once Trump got him, uh, the term deep state started getting pushed out there every which way. <laughs> it did get traction. Alex Jones was, of course, a big part of that, too. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and I have to say, I think it cost Alex a lot personally coming out for Trump the way he did after the election. I think, uh, you know, whatever somebody might think of Alex Jones as maybe somebody who definitely is a bit of a showman himself. But um, the kind of press treatment that he got, uh, including over his custody case and other things, after he oh, helped yeah. Trump get into the White House was absolutely brutal. And that's a real abuse of power on the hands of the media. Oh, there's so many things to comment. I, I just need to, to <laughs> rant a little back here now. Yeah, we saw polarization, unfortunately, during the election. In, in the beginning, before the election, nobody took Trump seriously. Uh, we knew he was a con man. We knew he, his affiliations to the mafia and all that. Mm -hmm. yeah, and we also knew that he was... Uh, because I remember people who are now religiously worshipping Trump yes. were ridiculing him. So something really bad happened there. And when Infowars went full march into the Trump camp, you saw the same polarization uh, on the other side. Let's take a, a similar independent media outlet, the Young Turks. Mm -hmm. They were originally Bernie people, but most of them went full Clinton, mm -hmm. even though they've been bitching and moaning about Clinton oh, yeah. for a couple of years. And you saw that polarization, you saw a tendency. And I think both Young Turks and Infowars calculated that, okay, we'll lose some, but we'll gain more. Mm -hmm. So that's when you saw a very, in the, at least at YouTube, in the independent media at YouTube, you saw a very polarization there, which plays perfectly into the hands of the divide and conquer. Because before that, you had crossover, you had people discuss, you had people who were legitimately in the middle, either because they were a little alt-right and a little pro-left, or they were just neither of them, like uh, libertarians or whatever anarchist, you name it. Mm -hmm. But when you get this polarization bullshit, th uh, then it's a complete win for the powers that be because people are distracted fighting each other. Before this, there were interviews, there was some kind of crossover, uh, even uh, directly they could interview each other, whatever. 
it was an independent media which was plural. Mm-hmm. I'm not so concerned about everybody agreeing with me. I'm not so concerned about everything has to represent what I... I, I want diversity. I, I think we need it. But that's kind of problematic now. Mm-hmm. And uh, just to come out of the closet, my view on Trump is that I'd rather, if the vote was Hillary or Trump, I would have voted Trump. Not because I was voting for Trump, but because I was voting against Hillary. Yes, right? yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I think there were better options even even uh, then. But like today, it's an obligation to be critical to Trump because Hillary is for now out of the picture. Yeah. Um, the Democrat aren't, and they are corrupt to the bone, of course, but the same goes for the Republicans. And Mm -hmm. when we see how the internet is under attack, net neutrality is under attack, and I see the looting party starting already. So I wouldn't expect, I I think there's some good indirect results for us Mm -hmm. that we can benefit for Trump taking over Mm -hmm. his administration. But I also see a lot of, and already when I saw who he started to pick for his cabinet, there wasn't too much to be happy about. Now, what's your take on that? That, This is my opinion. What's yours? Well, I think, uh, no, that's a really, I I think you summed it up quite well. The, um, The thing that I would say that I would add there is there is something fascinating happening. If you go to the 2012 election between Mitt Romney and Barack Obama, it was a flat election about nothing. Yeah. It was it was an election that was basically once in a while they talked about Medicaid increases or being tough on defense. And it was I'm a Republican. I'll talk tough on defense. I'm a Democrat. I'll talk about increasing Medicare. (laughs) And and there was nothing in the middle. One sanctioned deep state candidate versus another sanctioned deep state candidate. Right. So it's it's definitely was Monsanto, Goldman Sachs, right versus Monsanto, Goldman Sachs, left. (laughs) Yeah. And Obama, mm-hmm. it's just came out now because I've heard for the longest time this uh, hypothesis about him being a groomed CIA asset. But now I'm starting to believe it because mm-hmm. in mainstream media has come out that he went around saying that he would become president one day. Mm-hmm. How was it? He dated white women. Mm-hmm. I remember now he was in love with, with a woman. Mm -hmm. And he went around saying when he was a student that he was going to be a president. Oh, far out. But he married Michelle. Yes. More or less as some kind of convenient thing, like she's a proper lady for him as a president. Mm -hmm. An interracial marriage would probably be too much for even for contemporary America. I don't know. But some calculations like that. So why would he go around uh, saying to the white girls he was dating that uh, so confidently that he he's going to become the president? Gotcha. So that makes his candidature very, very interesting. It is. When uh, we combine the fact that we also have these indications that his, at his mother's side at least, his family was groomed by uh, or connected to Absolutely. the CIA. Right? Absolutely. Right? Well, uh, and this hasn't been picked up by the... You should take it and run with it, actually, mm-hmm. before someone else, because <laughs> I haven't seen in the conspiracy media anyone connected this yet. So you should Google it and find out. The story is out there. I will. I, I'll track it down now. Uh, I think it is important to point out there. Well, his mother working for this group in Indonesia and that front group is associated with the CIA. Her boss, her boss was Timothy Geithner's dad. Right. Wow. And then when he got, you know, when Obama gets in, he appoints Geithner. I mean, it was yeah. quite the circle there. But no, Obama, the way that he got in, nobody gets in like that. You know, he really was arranged. And uh, the fact that the CIA had Obama groomed very early on, it's very highly likely, in my opinion. It's a lot of weird gaps in Obama's history. Nobody's ever gone after it. They always had this thing about the Kenya birth certificate and all that. But really, there are much more weaknesses in his past story, which were unusual and never well explained, like the fact that nobody at Columbia University seemed to know him. Mm. (laughs) And he's supposedly been there for two years. I mean, there'd be tons of people. They never produced anybody who knew him. So that's odd. I mean, what was what kind of a program was that? Yeah. But we know that uh, in terms of uh, post-presidency, that uh, he's certainly been more vocal than most uh, presidents once they leave. So we'll see. We'll see what's going on there. But I 
I guess my point about the 2012 election, I'll go back to it like this. There was absolutely nothing of substance or of value there for the average voter. Well, you had Ron Paul, of course. Oh, yeah. Well, certainly. And he was cheated big time, just like Bernie. But it was too early for the masses. It was to too early. Uh, he ran. Understand that. He ran in 2008 and 2012. And you could see that. But that, again, was the primaries. Once you got to the actual election, it was just these two guys. Yep. And nobody got anything out of that. Um, but once you got to 2016, we have Trump and for whatever else we can say about Trump, these are the issues that came up during the campaign. 9-11 came up. The JFK assassination <laughs> came up. Yeah. Uh, UFOs came up on Hillary's side. The entire exploitation of the labor force being shipped out with NAFTA and GATT came yep, up. Yep. Vaccination, uh, because uh, I think his, exactly. his son is... Excessive yeah. vaccination. So we had... Uh, these were the important issues that were just being completely ignored, along with the fact that we needed to return our manufacturing base. They needed to have borders. There were a number of things. And I think that this was this was valuable. Uh, and the anti-war, he took the rhetoric yes. against uh, Syria and all that. We discussed it last time you were on, not in the Trump context, but the phenomenon itself. And I can see why he was become a clear winner among ordinary people, among people who are f sick and tired, mm -hmm. and also so-called alternative people. But we all know what's happened. But today, today, what do we make of it? Well, this is interesting because it's kind of a pattern. Because when you look at what Clinton was trying to do, she was coming in with the Cold War 2.0 idea, which is that yeah. we're going to intimidate Russia and maybe get into skirmishes with them, and we'll have a nuclear enemy again. Now, we had this thing going on where we're renewing all of our nuclear arsenal. It's a trillion dollar program that's been approved. There's supposed to be another trillion dollars that gets approved. So we need a nuclear enemy for that stuff to ring through Congress with a lot of approval. Mm. If we don't have one, if we're friends with Russia, there's really no need to pour trillions of dollars into upgrading our nuclear program, let's face it. Mm. So that is a piece of it and probably a very important piece of it. And she was the leading edge of the anti-Russia thing. As a matter of fact, all of the Russia push that they had about Trump and the election mm. came out of that camp and was driven by the media. And they just – they continue to needle it. Now their whole thing is Trump's son – was writing back and forth with someone who, you know. Yeah, but look, everybody sees through this. Yes. It's an obvious intelligence uh, distraction narrative. And no question. The Democrats were making fun of Mitt Romney when he tried to muster up Russia phobia too. Yeah, back in 12, had the same. But the thing is, it just goes to show how utterly bankrupt intellect the deep state is because, yeah, this old playbook worked for them back in the day when it was the communists or the Stalinist actually. Exactly. Run. But today, Russia is like every other country and everybody knows it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're doing America light yeah. <laughs> yeah. over there. It's just you know, there's some cultural differences. Uh, some of the oligarchy is a little bit more apparent, but... Mm -hmm. It doesn't stick. And I think the Trumpists are earning on this distraction too. Because as long as we're discussing those bullshit things, those fictive narrative, you can, if you're so-called liberal, you go down on the side of Russia history. Because as long as we attack Trump for stuff that he's innocent in, or which is yes. completely bullshit, yeah. you get automatically sympathy. Well, this is, um, <clears throat> this is the thing. They invented a 21st century Red Scare, which was ridiculous. Yeah. And there's no doubt about it. Putin, uh, some of the things that the deep state has a problem with him about is he wants to do, you know, he's banning GMOs. He wants to do his own swift transaction uh, system. All, all the things that make him sympathetic. Exactly, right. <laughs> Why don't they attacking him on stuff that is critical, like how they treat gays, for instance? Yep. And the same with Trump. Why don't mainstream media attack him on stuff that he should be attacked on? Uh, let's say how he just sold off uh, the last remnant of security. Now every private company can sell your entire browsing history. Yeah, well, it wasn't. it's anyone. not just Trump that did that. Now, that's a congressional push that they came through. Yeah. No, I don't think he does much. Yeah. Uh, it's his administration. I think he's just a symbolic uh, figure. It was right. definitely, had he stood against it, he would have been a great hero to those internet freedom people. So, yeah. 
but I'm not sure, even sure he's aware it's happening. <laughs> right. I mean, he's an old man. Yeah, yeah. He keeps to his Twitter, that's it. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think he's still sincere in a way. He's a con man, but he's an honest con man, if you see what I mean. I, that's my view on him. I don't think it's an interesting thing because I don't think that now you can get into the presidency being just true blue. It's just it's not going to happen. But I will say mm. this, in terms of the issues that were raised around the campaign and how he got in and how people, when they pulled the lever for Trump, were probably pulling it for the exposure of that system of things that he brought up during the election. That's important. That makes it different than the 2012 election, mm. that there were real issues that were discussed. And you saw that parts of the deep state were hysterical. Well, they were so hysterical that you had to think something good was happening. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That alone is enough to, to vote for, for someone like him. Well, I do feel that the CIA really was thinking to themselves, we're going to have to take over. And there were liberals. What was the most fascinating thing? There were liberal leaders and some of them in uh, journalism. And I know some of them. Some of them were great authors around some topics. And they were coming out and saying, well, you know, if the deep state takes over and takes Trump down, I guess we can live with it. But even though we know there's dangers involved, but hey, if the CIA has to come out and do what the voters couldn't do, then we're all behind it. And I was like, well, they just gave up any kind of <laughs> right to guide the future of the country right there because they want some weird shadow deep state because it agrees with them on this one issue. Because they're, they're, they're lost in the symbology thing. Yes. That's the problem. They're not going behind uh, the labels. Yeah. It's the same thing. We discussed the mass immigration last time. I mean, here we surgically seek out the secular regimes in the Middle East. I say we, but uh, <laughs> and higher than the most insane fanatics, the, the, the very boogeyman that we're supposed to fear and hate in order to lose our freedoms. Oh, yeah. And we use them to crush and demolish these secular regimes that are demonized. I, I think the last one is Syria. After that, it's all gone. And then we mass flood, uh, obviously, sincere people who, who run from the hell. Now, people think this is some kind of uh, liberal scheme. But if I was a Bormann, and I live today. That's exactly what I would do mm -hmm. to turn people into fascism, to turn people into authoritarianism, <laughs> because that's the backlash. Yeah. But people never go behind who earns, who benefits, follow the money, right? And the same thing here when we discuss the election. Um, yeah, those retarded people you talked about, you, you call them liberals. But if you look at the word liberal, it, it's uh, opposite, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, true. Nobody earns the term conservative or liberal anymore because the, neither of them are either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> absolutely right. But anyway, so, so my point is just this. If the deep state was, I, I think the deep state was sincerely afraid because it's obvious that Trump has some issues. He, he doesn't march lockstep with the culture of the elite. Mm -hmm. He has narcissistic tendency. And so they were afraid that, geez, with this guy, in the cockpit we can't control him mm -hmm. so and the problem isn't that they are afraid i think that he would hurt them as much as we have to make ourselves come out of the closet in order to take control yeah and we can't afford people understanding that's what's going on because either we have to let this madman uh, run about with his own agenda or we have to take over either by killing him or by some manipulation of, and that's what I think is going on. Actually, I think okay. the deep state is now relaxed. We saw it uh, when the military industrial complex got their first Syria attack out of, out of the Trump administration. Yeah. So, well, <laughs> I'll tell you, there's a, there's a few things you have going on there. One of them is, I don't think they want to kill Trump. I think that with the special counsel, they want to neuter Trump. Yes. Uh, so they have the special Russia Council, which shouldn't even exist. I mean, the Russia Council is a waste of money. It's a waste of millions <laughs> of dollars. They're not going to find anything. And, you know, the, the thing about a special council is they're hired and given this gigantic budget to find something. So they have to find something. So it has to be damaging. But they don't, you know, in terms of the actual Russia narrative, if they had anything, he would have been out of there already. Oh, yeah. Because they've been working on this for two years. We wouldn't hear the end of it. Yeah, exactly. So they don't have anything tangible. What they have is the big wave 
of the fact that they still have some power and this is how they make him uncomfortable in office and in affection. Plus they have an innocent thing and that is that many people have made business with Russia as they have with oh, yeah. Italy, as they have well, with England. As I mean, they, you know what I mean? We would instantly go to Clinton's, <laughs> Clinton's deal, clearing the deal for yeah. Russia to buy 20% of US uranium. I mean, that is a treasonous offense. That's a good sleight of hand, isn't it? <laughs> she has something to hide. Let's try to pin it on. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. But mm. I do think that the phase that we're in is dangerous because what they want to do with Trump is very sim- uh, it's very similar to what they wanted to do with JFK. JFK, what they didn't understand, the, the deep state back then – and I've studied this pretty deeply, and I'm positive yeah. that they expected Nixon. Right. Uh, and we're talking about 200,000 votes, and most of them in Chicago, uh, where he won Illinois, and that's how he carried the Electoral College. JFK was not supposed to win the election <laughs> um, by a long shot. But uh, Papa Joe and the Mafia connections were yes, handy. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that, that's mm. the kind of thing that comes in handy. And uh, also having LBJ as your running mate who can fix Texas, it's pretty good. Yeah. But um, nonetheless, JFK did an amazing job to get in the running because it wasn't a very popular period there, you know, because of the Cold War and all the rest of it. So he knew how to do the campaigning like a hawk and sound tough and all that. And he was great uh, in the debates and all the rest of it. So, But when he got in, they had a situation where they had to scramble because they had all these plans set up for Nixon getting in. And I think that's the last time that the deep state was freaked out except when Trump got in. (laughs) Because I think between the two – and again, it has to do with money because the Kennedys had a lot of money. The Kennedys were the equivalent of Bill Gates. You know, that's the kind of wealth they were fortune, you know, they were in the top 10. And in America with Trump, the long arm of the Trump money was something that they did not count on. You think when they start getting into really, he's a billionaire now, but I don't think he was really a billionaire. Um, I think he just pretended to be. He, I mean, he wasn't poor, but uh, uh, well, for example, a Mitt Romney rolling into position to take on the establishment versus a Trump. Trump has much deeper financial connections. Trump's right. Trump's connections with the deep state also, with an aspect of the deep state, which is the National Association of Manufacturers. Mm. This is a very interesting aspect I talked with Professor Scott about. Not a lot of people know that this this wing of the deep state has been suppressed for a long time. But with the advent of 3D printing and the potential for a lot of printing to come back on our shores, Mm. uh, this National Association of Manufacturers has great power again. And, you know, early on, they were members of the John Birch Society. They were uh, the Koch brothers. Their dad was in this. And so the deep state split between this manufacturing group and the mafia on one side Mm. because the mafia was losing all this money from Obamacare. And this, this is a gigantic piece of the puzzle and we know Trump himself is also connected to the mafia. There's no question. You have to be. Yeah. And uh, candidates like Giuliani and Christie, <laughs> uh, Trump played them in the beginning. Yes. Yeah. So that part of the deep state uh, supported Trump. And I also think uh, nationalistic parts yes. or anti-globalist parts of the deep state supported him. But the big question is how much... Does he live up to anything? And is stuff getting better? Is it getting worse? Is it same shit, new faces? Um, um, well, I think the the push to war part with Russia that Clinton was pushing for Cold War 2.0 was over the minute mm-hmm. that Trump got in the White House. And they just announced a ceasefire in the western part of Syria when Trump and Putin met. I thought that's a really good sign of what they're doing. Now, Trump being in there and working with the military and having the deep state there, there's no guarantee that he's not going to go sideways on the war part. But he doesn't seem to have um, – that doesn't seem to be his first instinct. I'll put it to you that way. Whereas Clinton, it was her whole organization was around the war talk. Oh, yeah, so yeah. I think in that sense, we have a better chance of um, missing the war card. Yeah, I, I think our best chance is if the Trump supporters grow up and start holding him accountable instead of defending yeah. him about everything. Yeah. But then, but that won't happen because if if the mainstream media continues with these red herrings, 
then the Trumpists will be knee-jerk, reactionary, defending. But if they manage to put him accountable, then he has a choice. Either a rollover to the pressure from within the deep state, Mm-hmm. Uh, but he won't do that because his personal sacrifice he's a narcissist he do, he doesn't want to end up everybody hating him and yeah. not being reelected and everything he wants to be popular he wants to feel like a savior of some kind so if they hold him accountable he will stand firm on certain principle i think he's the most populist yes in the true sense of the word candidate we have <laughs> in a long time i absolutely agree i mean ron paul yeah. you could say but he was principled he would have gone against everyone mm mm-hmm. If there was something he believed to be right or wrong, and everyone tried to push him. Uh, well, yeah. Trump is the opposite. Trump will do whatever if he gets wind of what people want. No, I agree. But right now, there's no outer pressure on him. That's what I'm a little worried about. All there is, well, it's hard because what's going on is the media acting as the arm of the deep state is trying to remove Trump. Yeah. They're trying to remove him or neuter him <laughs> one way or the other. So, and I hope that they, they don't succeed because his vice president will. <laughs> his first thing will be, "What's your order, boss?" That's what he will ask <laughs> the deep state. I'm convinced uh, well, of that. Pence is certainly an institutional uh, Republican, and we certainly exactly. don't want him as president. Um, no, but I would say that as far as Trump goes, um, I think that they look at him the same way they looked at Kennedy. The deep state didn't want to deal with Kennedy because they had their own plans, and here he is hiccuping the whole system. Uh, Kennedy didn't want to expand into war. As a matter of fact, what's fascinating is if you look at Kennedy in the presidency, he really had cut back on the defense outlays to a dramatic thing. He wasn't going to support Vietnam War expenditures. It wouldn't have happened. So they would have missed out on all that money. They already had missed out on Cuba War. So he just had to be removed at that point. Yeah, yeah, but Kennedy had to be taken out, not j- just because they couldn't control him, but because of everything he wanted to implement. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that's lacking in Trump. I don't think he's going to implement anything so challenging as what Kennedy wanted. He wanted to smash CIA. He wanted to out the UFOs. Yep. He wanted to cooperate in space <laughs> with Soviet. I mean, there's no <laughs> end to suicidal <laughs> implementation on his part but you can say about trump that uh, he's going to divide society but they can live with it it's not a big deal for the powers that be mm-hmm. but i don't see any big thoughts i don't see any big visions that are threatening to the powers that be except for like you say yeah i, I don't want to play all your wars okay so the industrial military complex has to take some economic losses but it's not like he's saying, I'm going to out you and destroy you. If he did, he would be killed. Well, that I'm coming stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's true. Um, there's this whole period that we're in where the debt growth model is coming to an end. And they think on the deep state side, they think they need those wars in order to maintain profit and control. So if they don't get them, that puts it puts them in complete opposition to Trump, which is a very dangerous situation. Yeah. Uh, and that's where I, the position I think we're rolling into, and that's why they see oh, him as such an enemy. And I think that the deep state right. is really using those elements in the media that want to go along. But Trump isn't a pacifist. Couldn't they just uh, reroute the wars to somewhere else than, let's say, North Korea or something like that? Well, no, uh, see, I can totally see Trump want to bomb uh, yeah. some countries. Well, you know, <clears throat> here's the interesting thing about that. When you see people like John McCain, John McCain is only interested in having war in Syria and having a firm stance against Russia. All this stuff goes up around North Korea, and it's actually John McCain who says, oh, Trump's moves down there threaten me, or or, you know, they make me feel like uh, he's not dealing with a full deck and all the rest. And it's like, hey, wait a minute. What's the real threat here? (laughs) Nuclear North Korea is a much bigger threat than Russia. Give me a break. So- Or Syria. Yeah, but for us, there's no money there. If we go down and bomb North Korea, There's no oil fields around there. There's no Middle Eastern gas routes, Mm. none of that stuff. So it doesn't profit us. Plus, it's actually dangerous because there's... uh, It's very dangerous. Oh, yeah. yeah. And not just that, China too. You don't want to mess with China. Well, China doesn't want the war there because they'd get thousands and millions of refugees over their border. They're not interested in that. They'd have to deal with any nuclear fallout. They're not going to let it happen down there, in my opinion. 
So it will be a third world war, even if we attack. Um, I mean, yes, yeah, Syria is a proxy war, but North Korea is more. Yeah, when I say I don't think they'd allow it to happen, I don't think they'd allow North Korea to do it. <laughs> oh, right, right. Yeah, and this is what I think. And also, we have to remember Kim Jong-un, okay, let's get real about him. Okay, he grew up in Switzerland. <laughs> right. And he spent most of his uh, adult years in Europe. So this is not some like... Certainly, he's arrogant and he's power mad, but this is not. I mean, he's he understands the world. He's been around. It's not like he grew up in some camp in North Korea. Mm -hmm. um, so he certainly understands a lot of the, how the political game is played. And here's the deal with North Korea: we have a, uh, a 1994 clip of Clinton saying that he will end the North Korean state if they do anything nuclear with South Korea. Okay, that's 1994. That's 23 years ago. We're playing the same game again. And what happened then? They went forward. They tried to put sanctions on them. Eventually, they got a ton of money because they were saber rattling. So North Korea has this tendency to come out and say, we've got bombs. We got this. We got that. And then they get lots of money and they shut up. Mm. So uh, now if he is upping the game too far and saying, I have an ICBM and I'll put a nuke on it, I get, they, are, they will be hit. But I don't – my feeling is the pattern of this game is they come out and saber rattle and get money. So I think that's what's going on there. I don't think China is going to allow him to set off a nuke down there because they've got – look, they have 7.5. We, we have 2.5 growth in America. Okay, they have 7.5. Yeah. They're, are they going to sacrifice that with a nuclear cloud, a nuclear incident on their border? Not only that, but uh, they are the creditors of – America. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You don't want to say <laughs> it's the honey pot. <laughs> <laughs> so when we think of it like this, the North Korea situation, I agree with you. It's much more of a war situation than the stuff that they're talking about in Syria and Russia. And anyway, what more what more can be done with Syria? It already looks like Berlin after the war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let, let, let's not forget the deepest level here. And that is India and China are basically doing the space work now. Yes, for America. The globalists are globalists because they understood that, hey, instead of just hijacking America and making the citizens our slaves, why don't we take over the globe <laughs> and make the citizens our slaves, right? Yeah. So then we, like in America, uh, is it Detroit, that area? Okay, cars there, agriculture over there, Wall Street money in, in New York, this here, that's there, you know, well, it's the same thing on the globe now. Mm -hmm. This country or this area produces this, that area, this. Uh, so uh, a real world war, that's not just a proxy war. Or uh, I think Middle East uh, and countries got the worst deal in the globalism because they become the zones for yeah. battles. <laughs> so what are we going to do in the Middle East? That's where we're going to fight yeah, the wars. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they would have done it in Africa if it wasn't for all the resources. That's too precious uh, many places. Well, there's no payoff. There's no payoff. That's the thing. Well, well, there are – Africa has a lot of resources, but I mean oil is very crude. All we have to do is just stick something in the – it doesn't matter if we bomb everything <laughs> as long as we can pump oil out. But there's other kind of resources in Africa. So, so yeah, so I think in the globalist scheme, um, the whole world now is – more or less the whole world is a part of their planning. And yep. Um, yep. they don't want hiccups in that vehicle. And, and so, yeah, China, we need China. The reason I'm, I'm not looking at Putin as a savior, mm -hmm. like so many do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's good what he does with GMO and all that stuff. But he could have come out with all these big secrets long ago if he really wanted to. If he wanted the world to know what's going on. He has True. It. Neither has China. They're all on board. Well, in, I mean, they also... The deepest level. Yeah, they have their own UFO programs too. <laughs> yep, exactly. So they certainly understand that aspect. No, they're on board with the secrecy. Occasionally, uh, you know, like we saw about a month ago, they were talking with Putin and he said, well, you know, there are a lot of uh, – there's a lot of research about the fact that the deep state assassinated Kennedy and certainly we take wow. – for him to come out with that, I was absolutely blown away. And I was saying this is the, yeah. the type of openness that we are starting to see break through a little bit at a time. And, and that Trump did during the election. He did. He did. And this mm. is important because when the conversation opens up, anything can happen. 
Yeah. And that's an important fact. And it wasn't opened up. When we went back to 2012, like I was talking about, nothing happened there between Romney and Obama. It was a boring, stiff conversation. And there was none, none of these exciting, important issues came to the fore. Now, with Trump, I think people expected, oh, hey, he talked about it. He's going to fix everything. <laughs> mm. Well, no, but he got the conversation going. And that does count for something. I think it's huge when people can see what's actually going on. So the main yeah. point is with all this money that's missing from the budget and with all this jobs that have been shipped overseas and with the realization that the corporations are now running the thing into a global super state for the Davos crowd and for the Bilderberg group, then a lot more people, say, than four years ago are on board with that. They understand that a lot more. True. You you don't have to go far back when they just laughed off the word Bilderberg. Now it's like <laughs> a somber fact. Yeah. But I think also this is one of the reasons they were afraid because they saw how Trump gambled with it. It was like an invisible threat, like uh, I'm hinting at these things mm. uh, because I don't give a damn about the outcome. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because I'm not a part of the elite. Yeah, uh, he is a part of the elite uh, in terms of class. Yeah, but he's not culturally. He wasn't culturally <laughs> accepted. <laughs> exactly. Uh, he was like uh, the the despised uh, redneck uh, yes. cousin or something. <laughs> yes, and, and Putin obviously did the same thing here, right? Mm -hmm. When they do these things. Um, I think that's kind of what triggers them most, not because I, I think as much as they're afraid of what Putin or Trump and people like that are going to really say, because there are damage control. But it's the fact that the consequences of them saying that, what happens with the people mm -hmm. when people can see clearly now what's going on, uh, that they're losing control, because uh, not very long ago, the curve of the declining line of mainstream media uh, viewers or listeners or readers yes. has crossed for the first time the independent media. Yep. And one thing we didn't have time to discuss today is that uh, they had an organized attempt to take over YouTube and Google, as you probably know. Mm -hmm. Many people have emigrated from YouTube because of that. Mm -hmm. All these companies, <laughs> even uh, I think BBC was one of them, so <laughs> it's obvious who's in cahoots here. Disney, <laughs> everybody tried to force Google and YouTube. And, and Google and YouTube have now implemented censorship yes. uh, for independent. And, and I see that because I often, we like in our channel certain videos mm -hmm. because then they come in the front. Some keywords, if it has like Syria in it or yep. some, something, it won't even show at the front page of our channel or anything like that. So it's a lot of things they've implemented. This is just an example. And for YouTube and Google, the end game is that mm -hmm. this is my conspiracy hypothesis, but it's very realistic if you if you look into it. They've realized that TV is and, and of course, newspapers is already a dead media. Yeah. So they're thinking, OK, we need to be present online. Mm -hmm. Now, their problem is that the independent media is, is ruling online, right? We've been here for 10, 20, 15 yes, years, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and they don't want to play fair. So what do they do? Well, OK. Let's squeeze out the system critical voices from let's let's choose YouTube because that's the biggest platform right now for these things. Mm -hmm. Let's take over YouTube and let's transform it into a platform for all mainstream media, meaning, oh, right. yes, uh, not just Fox and CNN, but also MSNBC, uh, CBS, everybody are welcome here, all the competitors, because they're really on the same side at the end of the day, right? Oh, yeah. The, yeah. So this will be our playpen and let's get rid of all the others. That's their end of the game. And I think it's doomed to fail, if you ask me. Absolutely. Because even if they did manage to have a monopoly or more or less dominate YouTube, people would leave it because the problem isn't the platform, it's the contents. <laughs> well, they, yeah, I absolutely agree. They, they already slashed um, so much of what the independent media was using in order to monetize their channels and their websites and blogs and all the rest of it. And uh, by saying, well, your content's not accepted, your video's not accepted for monetization, there was this huge model where all those alternative sites depended on Google. Now, I never went into that, so I was happy. And we discussed <laughs> that last time, and that's we, clever of you. We did. Well, we were lucky because there were a lot of them who depended on it and actually were making good money doing it, and then they fell on their face. Yeah. And a lot of them got out. 
who yep. just, you know, they either got out or they're facing a much smaller bottom line in terms of doing their work. Um, so that part worked. They collapsed a lot of channels that talked about war, for example. Uh, they, they certainly got after these channels. At the right and at the left. Yes, absolutely. But it is interesting because now on Twitter, I find out from a lot of viewers that my content is listed as sensitive material. Yep. Some of your videos wouldn't show yes. at our front page when we logged in. Some would, others wouldn't. Wow. So you were struck, of course, by the censorship. How are you doing now? How is the show doing now? Are you getting enough to keep it afloat? Um, yeah. It is not mo so much a liability economically anymore. Okay. Occasionally a generous donator. Donations are much more. The YouTube thing is nothing. I could lose that tomorrow and it wouldn't make bigger difference. Uh, yeah, I gotcha. So you haven't lost much. Uh... <laughs> In fact, I was lucky and um, we came out even because we never depended on the advertisement, but we uh -huh. started with it right before. Uh -huh. But we didn't get struck because we've uh, categorized all our videos as education. They've started at news and they haven't gotten around to smack down on education oh, yet. Oh, excellent. Oh, that's a great... This was just coincidental, right? <laughs> and because I never look at myself as current. We are more like, like I said to Fitz, we're lost at everything. <laughs> 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 Not breaking news, ending news, but we try to sweep up. So we still have all our... But we, it was the beginning of the advertisements. We didn't make that much money anyway. But when everybody who lost advertisement started to appeal to listeners for money, yes, they went into this um, Patreon. 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 Yes. Yeah, that actually struck us because you're just a guy, right? And you have to, you can't sponsor everything you like and listen to. So right. you have to choose. So we noticed donations declined when everybody started to beg for donations. Uh -huh. But but then we got a little income from the advertisement, so we came out even. You okay. see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> I right. <was> lucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. You have to make those choices when you're doing this because it's not like there's any system out there that's ready to support you <laughs> for doing alternative uh, independent media. Oh, no. But you, you've been smart. You've been spreading yourself in, already in different platforms. Right? Yes. You have yes. many platforms. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, where can people find you? Well, right now, of course, you can go to darkjournalist.com. That's the central hub for the work that I do. On YouTube, it's youtube.com forward slash darkjournalist. And the majority of the videos are there. I also am doing a satellite radio spot twice a week on Global Star Satellite. And those are the same shows that I'm running for the subscribers in uh, the Dark Journalist site. So we're, we're getting... Uh, and, and Vimeo too, right? Yes. On um, Vimeo, uh, you also are getting the kind of like core videos there on Vimeo. They're not all there, but there's a lot of shows that are available there. Um, and the way I look at it is really you want to be able to uh, deliver your work in a variety of mediums because you never know, for example... When I was doing the New Age Deep State thing, there were so many complaints from the company, the three-year disclosure marketing company against my videos that they were trying to wow. threaten the channel, to, to pull down the channel. Because, of course, mm -hmm. their, their legal threats were all kind of like bellicose. And, but this is the kind of sensitivity which, you know, I know YouTube pretty well. And so I know how to get around frivolous complaints. But the thing is, you do have to do that. And I think it's getting to this point where... It's fascinating because on one end of the spectrum, as an independent media outfit, you'll have the pressure of the mainstream media trying to get rid of you. And on the other end of the spectrum, you'll have those forces that are coming in to do marketing into the independent media space. The third forces. Third forces. And so it's you're getting caught in the middle. Yeah, I was just thinking that because when you put a critical light on them, you would expect some backlash from, from their people. Absolutely. There's no question about it. it is so you notice it already. Yeah, but I would say this, that what happens, though, whenever you open up the conversation, it's a wild card. <laughs> so in a way, opening up the conversation against the mainstream media, opening up the conversation against those third force aspects in independent media – Open, mm. you know, opens the door to a wild card and you, you might just find this pathway between the two. And that's what we've been doing. But certainly the important thing from my point of view is to bring forward the ideas unfiltered without the junk conspiracy on top of yeah, and without the pressure from the mainstream media official story. 
Yeah, we discussed this the last time and uh, a problem I consider then that I think is still haunting us is that how are we, you know, supposed to win this battle? Because like I was uh, insinuating earlier in this discussion is that we have a, mm -hmm. uh, we are not following into this uh, false dichotomy, the black-white thing. We are trying to get to truth, which is more synthetic and you have to have several thoughts yeah, at the same time. I say we, I, I mean, not just you and me, but many good outlets out there are like that. I'd, I'd say throw in skeptic or tube since i already mentioned yes it. but the problem is like you say we fall between two chairs uh, and uh, we can come in the scissor and also it's harder to reach a bigger audience because unfortunately the more you dumb down the bigger impact you'll have right that's why Corey Good and those people and or Gaia TV can run with what they've got. Yeah. So, but I, this is the reason I also invited you now is to help you get some focus on this breaking story of yours. Yes. Because I, if enough people, um, subversive people, anti-authoritarian, alternative, conspy, what you want to call it, gets it then truth can come out on the good side of this and um, people like you who's been working so hard for that can can actually earn from it rather than suffer. Oh, well, yeah, I really appreciate that. What, what I see about all this is that with a real quality outlet of information like what you guys do, in the grand scheme of things, things like the three-year disclosure marketing plan and Corey Good and David Wilcock, they they will burn out because yeah, they're true. they're but the very nature of their thing is to borrow content, and borrow is a very kind word in this case. Yeah. Uh, but they're going to repurpose content from other users, and it's like a fashion thing. It is it has to run out. Yes. Uh, so I will say that people will come to know quality that's consistent, and in like the shows mm. that you do and the guests that you bring forward. So this is very important, and. From my perspective, what I've learned from dealing with this whole thing around the New Age Deep State, on one hand, I've given myself a window by researching their activities on that end of the independent spectrum, uh, you know, this third force coming in. But I've always seen it, so I've been aware of it anyway. But the education that I've got is this, which is the real outfits, and I consider like ForbiddenKnowledgeTV.net, for example, Solari.com. Giza Death Star. These are important sites that have important yeah. information, the work that you guys are doing, what we do at Dark Journalist. This is a core of information that works as a bulwark against the rise of that kind of third force. junk conspiracy, yeah. third force. Yeah. And, and it also stands very strongly against the mainstream media pressure to eliminate the independent alternative voices. So in a way... This is a real strong core, and uh, you know I, I only see that this core is going to grow because I think that the content is exciting, the information is useful, yeah. and uh, the th it's thought provoking stuff. So for people who are coming in for that, they're going to get what they came in for. I agree, but I think uh, a requisite for succeeding is uh, two things. One, we have to embrace diversity. Mm -hmm. We have to accept that everybody isn't agreeing about everything. Yes. Uh, because it's a it's an advantage that you will have different sub uh, versions. It's not just about opinions or what you identify with or what ideas you subscribe to, but also what approaches you take. Some will be more concerned about, let's say, spacecrafts and technology and stuff like that. Some more, maybe more spirituality. So maybe more science and, and so so that's one thing diversity we have to accept it and the other thing is not to fall into the false dichotomy because in addition to the mainstream pressure and the bullshit pressure right, right they can right. also have the false dichotomy pressure like you saw in the extremely polarizing times around the election oh yeah where where you can lose perspective and suddenly potential. Uh, allies becomes quote-unquote enemy because you chosen the wrong label the wrong color yes wrong symbol to yep. identify with and that's very dangerous because that is the game they've been playing well, the whole cold war was about that god damn it mm -hmm. yeah right right they're experts <laughs> at it they've been at it for a long time yeah and i think a part of the grown-up movement is to be able to tolerate that not everybody agrees about everything and also not lose ourselves in any 
temporary wave of symbol. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And you can look at this in all these different communities that we've talked about, uh, whether it's around the political deep state work. There are people who – it's fascinating – Professor Scott was <laughs> he's he has some great stories along this line, but one of the great stories that he has is that there's this writer who absolutely reruns uh, his stories uh, at global research and all the rest of it. And you know, he absolutely gets this spot on and that spot on. But whenever uh, Scott mentions nine eleven, Forget it. He's listening to conspiracy <laughs> theorists. His stuff goes in the shoot. You know, it's it's all mm. over. And this is the nature of the thing, right? You have these people who they have their pet issues, and if they, if you don't agree with them on one particular thing, then you're out, just completely. Yeah. Or you're you're a part of the plotters. Yes, right. Like you, you're an Illuminati agent to the <laughs> sincere followers of uh, Corey. Corey, good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the easy answer. And the funny thing is, oh, yeah. we saw it in the 9-11. Bill and the witch. <laughs> exactly. We saw it in the 9-11 movement when Judy Wood came forward with her theories. Yeah, poor woman. And it was, this was fascinating because she had a great body of work. Hmm. And it was a really interesting angle. But because people were so married to these different narratives around thermite or whatever it happened to be, uh, she became persona non grata. Oh, yeah. She was shut down. For those groups. And, you know, this is ridiculous because they all believe that something happened around 9-11 that was instigated as a deep event by covert forces. But nonetheless, because she had a different theory than where they were coming from, she became a disinformation agent, you know, poop. Yeah. So this is the kind of thing. And this is the problem, I think, when we get into the independent side, which is there's a lot of pushing a, a particular narrative. We, which goes back to my point that we have to grow up. And a part of that is to accept diversity. Mm -hmm. And also we have to accept that we can live with not having the final answers about everything. <laughs> right, right. So what if we don't know the whole and entire truth? People need to train to be open and critical. So, okay, I accept that this isn't true, but it doesn't mean that I have to run to whatever polarity that has. Uh, yes. For me, it's like, okay, I accept that per now... This I don't understand entirely, uh, but I'm open to learning more. And uh, I'm also open to revising if the evidence points out. And I, I think that kind of thinking can be promoted in, in more general terms within the uh, so-called alternative. And then, yeah, absolutely. Then, it, then they can't use those tricks against us because then you have a, an alert population. Mm -hmm. Let's say like 9-11, right? You weren't there. You weren't people who actually perpetrated it. So how dare you be emotionally attached to one hypothesis and, mm -hmm. you know, scream over. You, you're not better than the debunkers when you do that. Yeah. Absolutely. And this goes for anything. Anything we've discussed today that has triggered people, oh, listen to them, oh, I don't agree. Fine, don't agree. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> because it's easy to know what didn't go down, but it's hard to know exactly what happened. And that's why we have to be open for several possibilities of what has happened, as long as we agree about what didn't happen. You see what I mean? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, the point is to kind of to arrive at the truth is not to shut out the facts when it doesn't agree with your perspective at all. This is the, the nature of the thing. So I think we do need a, a better idea of how we think about evidence. And in alternative media, it's, it's on the independent side, really, when you get right down to it, the only things that are going to survive and do well, in my opinion, are outfits that don't have a lot of bias. Because in the grand scheme of things, it gets old. And if you want someone to trust you as a source, then they're going to need to see that you have the wide angle lens. One of the biggest dangers that I see coming into the alternative media and into the space generally around alternative research, independent media is what I call savior programming, you know, and we'll save yeah, that for another show. But this, yeah. this is what we're seeing, which is one thing is a savior, you know, like this guy is a savior, this movement's a savior, this particular point of view is a savior. Even the flat earth thing is kind of savior programming. Yeah. Now that's an also an old card, an old game. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, it is. And uh, it's a dangerous one. And I think at this point, because the internet has grown 
to such a degree, I think we're seeing heightened levels of marketing and also PSYOP manipulation of the space on a level that we haven't really seen before. So we've seen it in degrees in mainstream media, but I think it's going into kind of a heavier phase. And I think the only way to deal with it is to kind of get the paranoia and the superstition out of the independent research and just go for the facts. Yeah. Uh, And that, uh, again, I I would emphasize the need for diversity Mm -hmm. and and your point not falling into particular pet hypothesis. And also sincerity, I think, is a big part of it. I think sincerity at the end of the day will come through if you are sincere. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's it's um, um, somehow many people can pick up on on fake eventually. I think so. I think so. You see, yeah. just look at politics. I think that's the genius of Trump that he was kind of I call him an honest con man. <laughs> <laughs> people know his shortcomings. Yes, there's nothing they can try to taint him with that will shock us because we know what's true about him. God knows he has a lot of them, <laughs> and then he's like honest, like a child in all that. <laughs> Completely different from Clinton, who is everything is calculated and you know <laughs> controlled, True. right? So, whereas Ron Paul and Bernie are more straight shooters, they are more like uh, yeah. sincere in an other way than than Trump. But no, diversity is the thing. Like Kennedy said, um, if we cannot now end our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. <laughs> so. So that's what I mean, and a diversity in ideas and in quality, but we have to have the common goal of being sincere and also having the right focus, you know, critical against the third force and the first force. I I definitely agree with that. And I also, uh, I want to just throw in there uh, this call to like ethnocentric style reporting that you see popping up because of different movements, because of different crises and stuff, mm. isn't going, that's not going anywhere near a good place either. And uh, I, I don't, I don't recommend it. It has no future. Uh, if nothing else, if people don't see through it, uh, at least the powers that be won't accept it because yeah. it doesn't play into their globalism. I, I said, uh, was it with Catherine? I said that, um, uh, nationalism doesn't have to be like Nazi nationalist socialism, right? There's many versions of nationalism. Oh, yeah. And and I believe there's some healthier outputs too. Mm -hmm. But nationalism is just one of many ways of opposing globalism. It's not the only way to... It's not the only alternative. That's a dichotomy again. Okay, we can only choose between globalism and nationalism. Right, right. (laughs) No. First of all, there are healthy (laughs) versions of internationalism, like trade with the world instead of warring with the world. Yes. And there are many ways of nationalism. I mean, you can have uh, cultural, you can have uh, geographical, you can have um, spiritual, you can have ethnic. There are many things you can identify with. But um, uh, at the end of the day, there has to be solutions for as many as possible. Yeah. Uh, Ideally, the whole world, because the whole world is, uh, what was Alex Young call it? A prison planet, right? <laughs> right? So there has to be a global liberation. And that, that's the problem with nationalism. It, it only picks on certain aspects of, of the liberation. So, but I see, I see healthy stuff in it, like a counter to the bad globalism. Mm-hmm. But I do think that some parts of nationalism will be a stooge for the powers that be, like uh, divide and conquer, right? Mm -hmm. So let's flood the West with immigrants and we can get a reaction. Yeah, Uh, this is the dangerous part. And I know we could do a show just on that because it's, it's a major issue. It's only grown since we've spoken to much bigger levels. And there are solutions for it in terms of how we can approach it. <laughs> I definitely see that the, in, at the end of the day, I mean, we're looking at a number of situations that are organized in order to bring about a corporate global super state. Yeah. So um, preventing that from happening, and they've had a lot of issues implementing that too. Um, but... Part of preventing that, I think, from happening is to see through things like the incredible uh, push of these 
immigrants out of these countries is to see the reason that the immigrants are flowing out of these countries is because their own territories are being bombed, for example. And why it's happening. Yes. Because uh, if we put our guns in, in our teeth and start attacking uh, each other instead of hitting upwards, then we have become the equivalent of what Daesh is over there. You know, ISIL yep. or whatever you call it. Yes. Yeah. They want people to become like Daesh. Yeah. And they know people will get angry here. They know they can't play this con game forever. And then the ideal uh, reaction is that we become like that. And one equivalent with that would be to hate uh, the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like the Daesh hate America, the Western decadence. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's hate these backwards, um, primitive, perfect. Mm -hmm. Checkmate. Yeah, well, I mean, who's funding ISIL? You know. Exactly. That's my point. So well, it's, yeah. <laughs> and, and who's making it so that we get a similar primitive hate wave here? Yeah. So my point is a fist can only knock down the, the oligarchs 0.1% if it's united. Th then it's a fist. Mm -hmm. And I do think everything that helps truth. Uh, I see worth also among outlets like uh, Alex Jones. Mm -hmm. And I see at the opposite side, uh, Jimmy Dore, for instance. I like him. So you have many people across the political spectrum that's pulling in the same direction uh -huh. if you can kind of not identify with these false dichotomy symbols is my point. You can find uh, those independent media channels that go across the spectrum and I think that they are there and although there's a lot of noise and a lot of junk out there uh, in the grand scheme of things – uh, the quality exists. I mean, Across the board. yeah, we're definitely in a period. It's kind of like there's a pretty good dividing line between quality and <laughs> stuff that's really falls into a category of just non-listenable. And uh, it is easy to spot, I think. Indeed. Uh, at least if you're used to quality, I think uh, at the end of the day, you'll, you'll um, start seeing through the third force. Absolutely. Speaking of that, um, if people uh, go to your website, do you offer material that's not uh, publicly free, like a bonus stuff? Uh, yes. If you are a subscriber, then um, you do get – first of all, you get all the audio files and you get bonus episodes and you get bonus content. Um, and part of that really – you know, the way we do it is it's three twenty five a month, so it should be ultra affordable. But um, you also get episodes first. That's one of those things. But we try to put as much of that in there as possible. I'm always trying to do more and think outside the box with it. Um, but certainly being a subscriber has a lot of benefits in this sense and that everything is easily accessible and you're always the first to get it. So $3 a month? It's three twenty-five. Yes, yeah, $39 a year. Right. So basically if we buy you a coffee a month, we get access. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Good deal. Yeah, and I drink a lot of coffee, so it works out. <laughs> Me too, I know. <laughs> I know. We need all those donations. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Lots of coffees to go through. <laughs> it's been an excellent chat today. Uh, yes. As, as usual, I feel there's uh, more we didn't go into than, than what we yeah. did get to touch. But uh, hey, I plan uh, hanging around for a long time. So Excellent. Oh, we'll definitely, we'll definitely do it again. And, uh, you know, we went from the secret space program to theosophy to Trump to the deep state. I think we're doing okay. I know. I know. <laughs> we covered everything. <laughs> and it definitely is a pleasure. Uh, it's always great to come on your show. And I want to say this again, that uh, the quality of guests and shows that you have uh, is something. That's why I'm always listening. Cool. And, and uh, right back at you, buddy. <laughs> and, and by the way, give my regards to our mothership. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And thanks again to Daniel List for taking the time to drop by the forum. Now, I want to add a little postscript to this our discussion, because there may be some out there listening who wonder why we're spending time and energy on debunking. Why are we going after people who 
after all seem to want disclosure and, and we're all for disclosure, right? So, so how bad can it be? Well, the reason is that it's actually imperative. It's, it's incumbent upon us to be the debunkers. It's more important that people who fight for truth in different regards on different matters are concerned with the lies nesting in our own backyard. Now, we, we, of course, we don't know exactly what's going on in people like Wilcox and Good's hearts and minds. But regardless of the motives, the sum result is that they are polluting the same waters we're all swimming in. And, and when indeed there are outlets posing as truth seekers, but serving us half lies, whether or not the, this is an operation, a black ops or a psyops, and whether or not the disinformation and the misinformation is deliberate or not, they're still polluting our waters. If we ignore it, if we accept it, it is playing right into the hands of the so-called first force, as Daniel names it. The same people you are supposed to be fighting to get the truth out of, the establishment liars, then they would become a tentacle of that very same hydra. So why stick to chopping off just the head you can see? Shouldn't we get rid of all their heads? And if we don't do it, if we leave it to the debunkers, you know what will happen. They don't differ. In fact, the many of those debunkers work for the same first force. So, no, we do not want to be put in the same bag as these loonies. We need to clean our own house. We cannot leave it to those who pollute it in the first place, lest we will all be bogged down by their baggage. Corey Good, David Wilcox, and those people is at best a red herring for their own money, status, attention-seeking, in my opinion, but more likely an interlope to utterly discredit the notion of a classified space program and are muddying the waters for genuine researchers exposing it. Who will take it seriously after Gaia TV and the entire commercial industry of blue avians, Corey's kids, and even cartoons have had its field day with it? Such disinfo agents are either inadvertently or deliberately currently turning the entire thing into a cult, offering nothing original in the process, but leeching on notions already known from factual and sober research, spinning it into their own fantasy orgy. Indeed, as soon as something is popular, you can be sure they will ride that wave, whether it be breakaway civilization, Nazi, anti-gravity crafts, Antarctica, hollow earth, Atlantis, etc., etc. And what about all those truth-seeking people, especially the young ones out there? If you search one of these keywords, you may as well get up in the third force junk conspiracy. No, it's a time for everyone to take a stand and not let these forces set back the progression we'll be fighting for for so many decades to get this into a serious attention, serious research and be taken seriously by the sleeping masses. And it's getting a deeper level of serious when they are trying to silence people like Daniel, who sticks his head out and does some proper work, trying to silence him with his personal attacks and, and getting his YouTube account closed. Oh, and we must also kudos Bill Ryan for sticking his head out and doing something very tough. This is people he has met, maybe he regard them as friends still, his loyalty to truth is strongest and comes first. And, I mean, one thing is to debunk these crazies when you have nothing to do with it. Bill Ryan has put so much on the line because he was, in, in the specific case of Good and Bashiago, he was um, implicit in getting them out there. 
Now you can say, well, then it's his uh, responsibility to to also clean up when he realizes what Frankenstein monsters they, they become. Yes, yes, but still, put yourself in those shoes and you try to do it. No, that reflects uh, stamina, principles, genuinity. So kudos to Ryan. And also kudos to Richard Dolan for coming out against his mockery and sham and to Stephen Greer for the same, and to all the serious, authentic researchers of this field, like uh, Catherine Fitz, Peter Lavanda, Joseph Farrell, Richard Hoagland, people like we mentioned in the show, and many, many more, we'll have on several of them. As a contrast, people like Good, Wilcox, and Salah, unfortunately, he's been sucked into it, are viruses to truth. If anyone is still on the fence, not able to ascertain such basic distinction, just read Richard Dolan's excellent article that he came out with recently called On Corey, Andrew and the Whistleblowers. So that's why we have to debunk it before the mainstream does. And and to those of you who find it amazing that anyone is falling for scams like this, Uh, remember that they are targeting young people, even children. I mean, look at all the scams that people believe in in general. <laughs> look at the look at the political scene today. Look at uh, how the corporations are thoroughly raping the world. Wars, destruction, surveillance. There's no accountability at top, and people are distracted by all sorts of bullshit. And I'm not even blaming sports or or entertainment television. Even within politics, even within uh, social life, people are distracted by by crumbles, by fighting uh, windmills. And so, but for many, fortunately, it's blatantly obvious these fabrications, these hijackings of uh, an academic subject, this propaganda, brainwashing, cultish activities. I mean, they can't even hold their story together and so exaggerated from the outset. And, And we need everyone in the independent media who covers these matters to take a stand and come out of the closets, out of the woodworks, onto the scene and flaunt your position because it will influence those who really falls for this type of crap. Everyone must join forces. Everyone who's concerned about truth. Because if they are rejected from the independent media itself, then the disinfo attempt and smear campaign fails. If not, it is left to the mainstream to debunk, who will have a field day with it. And all of independent media concerned about this will be discredited in the same process. As is the attention with this false secret space program operation. Well, this would probably be a good place to end my little rant. Now, just an update. Uh, If you go to our YouTube channel uh, and look at the front page, you will notice that we have launched another channel called Forum Borealis Shorts. You'll see some of the clips there in the front page of our ordinary channel. Don't ask me why we made it a separate channel. Stupid story, but done is done. And we would appreciate if you support our work that you subscribe to that channel. We need a lot of subscribers for both channels because of the features and options we get from that, which really helps our work. And at the end of the day, anything helping our work enable us to produce more shows faster, more frequent, and of course better. So please do that, and uh, also check out uh, the clips there. It's not just uh, teasers from the main shows. We'll also post there. Well, first of all, there will be teasers of unpublished main shows, so if you subscribe, you'll actually be able to get fresh stuff that you wouldn't get if you're just on the main channel. But also, we will, uh, by and by release old stuff from the bonus archives since Bella has obliged us by saying that all files are free. So yeah, even bonus stuff will eventually by and by be released and that's where it will be released because they are shorties too compared to the main shows who can run for hours upon hours. So check it out. You, If you like uh, the forum, you'll definitely like the shorts too. O- of course, support us by 
spreading the word, spreading our shows, that's just as important as a donation. And if you have donated, remember to join our website where you will get access to, to much more stuff. And right now we have lots of shows not released because we are short of video makers. So they are piling up in there. Um, and if you like playing around with images and even clips, you can sign up to become a video maker. You'll get half the revenue that the advertisement produces. And by the way, that's an important part of an income. So please uh, don't disable them when at our page, at our videos. And if you can stand suffering through them, that helps us a lot too. We get more kickback from an ad that's played out than one that is skipped immediately. I guess that's it for today. Yeah, you've been listening to the host of the show, Ah, and uh, backed up by all my good helpers. We'll be back with a vengeance. Be seeing you. number one.